Hello, my name is Mike Logston. I'm the pastor of the First Baptist Church here in Easton, Maryland. I'm delighted that you have chosen to join us today. We know that real life is not lived on the Sundays, but what we like to say between the Sundays or in our normal, everyday lives. Our prayer is that what you hear today will help you connect intimately with God and will equip you to live out your faith this next upcoming week. We hope that the next few minutes will inspire you to become more like Jesus, God's one and only Son, the Savior of the world. Again, thanks for watching, and listen carefully as you hear God speak to you from His Word today. Faith is an important part of Christianity. After all, you can't be a Christian if you don't have faith. But what is faith? Faith is the belief in something that can't be proven. I like to think of faith as my backup plan for the afterlife. I mean, who knows if this whole God thing is real? I live my life the way I want to live it and do the things I want to do. And one day, I'll die, and that'll probably be the end for me. But just in case heaven and hell do exist, I have faith. So I'll go to heaven, which probably won't happen because heaven probably doesn't exist. I may not have much faith in God, but I do have faith in the fact that if He does exist, my small amount of faith should be enough to get on His good side. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. What a contrast between the shallow Christianity that the truth is many of us see on a daily basis and that song that we just sang, It Is Well With My Soul, and the other song we sang earlier, Trust and obey. Let me ask you this this morning. Do you know what a victorious faith warrior looks like? Do you know what a, a faith hero looks like? And when you look in the mirror, do you see one? A professor once said that he boasted, rather, one of his callings in life was to shatter the faith of naive Christians as they came to his class. This is what he said, Just give me a room full of young, naive evangelicals and let me at them. You can just watch them drop like flies hit with raid when I challenge their faith in a deliberate, consistent manner. The truth is, most of us don't need a well-meaning professor to expose and shatter our shallow faith. The truth is, is that life has a way of really bringing into focus the reality of our faith commitment to God. And I want to share with you this morning, I, I believe that a shallow faith will never bring you to the point where you have that peace that passes all understanding that God intended for us. And so today, I want us to look at another one of the heroes of the faith and kind of see how God is working behind the scenes. Nothing that the person that we are going to look at today brought God's blessing or brought misery or agony into his life. The whole story this morning is that God was working and moving in this young man's life. In fact, we're going to be looking at the life of a guy by the name of Joseph. He faced more trials and difficulties than any of us in this room likely will ever experience. Do you realize that he had the opportunity to manage more wealth and power than any of us in this room will ever be in the position to grab a hold of? In fact, he had an opportunity to pay back people who wronged him the most in ways that probably we in this room could only dream of having, but he didn't. And we're going to see how his faith sustained him and it did not crumble under the realities of life because it's coming. It's coming. That moment of difficulty or that pinnacle of prosperity is coming and it's going to challenge your faith commitment and the foundation upon which you stand. And so this morning, I'd like for you to first begin by turning with me to Hebrews chapter 11 and then putting a finger back in Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to see another yet snippet of the life of a faith hero. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, or 22, rather, we get a scene from the very end of the life of this guy named Joseph. 
And what I want to do is as you read this, you're going to see we're going to have to go back to Genesis 37 through 50 and kind of look at the life of Joseph. We're going to find five faith lessons from Joseph. And then I want to ask you a very probing question at the end and three practical ways that we can move forward this morning. But this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and he gave instructions about his bones. Isn't that a miraculous, powerful statement of faith? (laughs) Maybe you don't see it. And so that's why what I want us to do is go back and look at the life of Joseph and kind of set this in context and build up and see how we get to this point because the truth is this moment of faith, which of all of the things in his life, why would the writer of Hebrews pick this last thing in his life as the pinnacle of his faith? Well, there's good reason. And the truth is all of his life was wrapped around some things that allowed him to lean in and trust when it seemed like he shouldn't. And so the story begins in Genesis chapter 37. We meet this guy. He's a dreamer. He is dad's favorite. He is a daddy's boy, and he certainly is not loved by his brothers, although he is loved by his parents. But yet, he's got this dream. In fact, he tells it to his brothers. He tells it to his dad. Hey, you guys, one day all of you are going to bow down to me. And of course, they said, well, why don't we just start now? Isn't that what you would do if your older brother or your child came to you, parent or older sibling? And they said, you are going to bow down to me later in life. Wouldn't that just be the a message you would just embrace? No? I don't think that I would either. I know my older brother wouldn't because he lived with me. So he, he would know not to do that. But nonetheless, we find him here and he's this dreamer. And one day his brothers go out to work and Joseph's daddy says, hey, go out and check up on the boys. In other words, I think he's saying, see what they're doing, bring me back a report so that I can, you know, do what I need to do. And so Joseph goes out and they see him coming and they say, hey, here comes that dreamer, he's coming. Let's get rid of him. To which one of his brothers says, no, 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 no. let's not do that. So finally he gets closer. They grab his coat, they pull it off. This is a coat that his daddy had given to him as a, a sign of significance. And they rip it off and they throw him down into this cistern, this pit. And they devise this plan. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. And then it says, so his, one of his brothers, Reuben, who wanted to save him, went off. And his other brothers, kind of interesting, it says, they sat down and they ate their lunch. <laughs> Could you imagine? Hey, guys, nice joke. Come on, okay, you got me. Yeah, all right, yeah. I, I won't share as many of those dreams anymore. And one of his brothers says, Judah oldest said, you know, guys, let's, uh, we shouldn't kill him. After all, he is our brother. He is our flesh and our blood brother. What a, what a brother. Uh, some of you may have a brother like that. No, don't raise your hand this morning. But what a guy. And so what they decide is we're not going to kill him. We're going to sell him into slavery. And so then the next time that we see him is skipping forward over to Genesis chapter 39 is he's taken as a slave. He's gone from being a rich boy to now being a sold into slavery slave. And he shows up in this guy named Potiphar's house. Potiphar is one of the guys who is in charge in Pharaoh's court and he's got some power. And so Joseph, we find out throughout this whole chapter, does some incredible things because, look at verse 2 of chapter 39, the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. In fact, later in the chapter it just says everything that he did flourished because God was with him. You know what the truth is this morning? Some of us have some myths that only good things happen when God is with us. But how could this be? Here is Joseph sold into slavery, but God was with him. He's a strapping, young, 17-year-old boy, and he's in this house, and his master goes off one day, and his wife, she gets that glimmer in her eye, and she looks towards Joseph and says, hey, Joseph, come come on, come on over to my bed. Let's sleep together. Let's have sex. 
Do you know what we learned from Joseph's first life lesson or faith lesson? Is that faith interprets life through God. No matter what the circumstances are, what's going on, faith interprets life through the lens of God. Look at chapter 39, verses 8 and 9. But Joseph refused to this offer from Potiphar's wife, and he said, With me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. And my master has withheld nothing from me except you, which after all, you are his wife, and so rightfully so he should withhold you. But... How could I then go and do such a wicked thing and sin against who? Who does it say? God. In fact, it's exactly what David said over in Psalm 51 verse 4 against when he had, had that relationship with Bathsheba and it seemed he killed somebody. But he said this, against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned. You see, Joseph just said, you know what? No matter what happens, I'm going to interpret my life through one lens, and that's the lens of God. And no matter what happens around me, I am going to make that the chief aspect to the decisions that I make. And so, of course, you probably know the story. She reaches out to grab him, grabs a hold of his garment, pulls it off, he flees, runs out, she keeps it, calls everybody back into the room, says, look, that Hebrew, he came in and he tried to sleep with me. Look what he's trying to do, and now he's run away. I screamed for help, and he got scared, and he ran away. The master came home. She just repeated the story. That Hebrew, your, your servant, tried to do this. So the Bible says that the master just burned with anger and had Joseph thrown into prison. Do you realize that he did good and got punished as if he didn't? But the Bible says the Lord was with him and everything that he did blossomed. In fact, he found favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Why? Because God was with him and God gave him success in whatever he did. Well, sometime later... Chapter 40 says, uh, these two guys come onto the scene, this cupbearer and this baker. And these two guys, they, they fell into um, some trouble with Pharaoh. And Joseph, meanwhile, you know, he's sitting in prison and he meets this guy, this cupbearer. And the cupbearer basically is the guy who is responsible to bring the cup to Pharaoh and to make sure that whatever is in the cup, he has tasted it. He knows that it will not kill the Pharaoh, and so he gives it to the Pharaoh, and he says, my life is staked on the fact that what's in that cup will make you live, Pharaoh. But for whatever reason, this cupbearer and the baker, who is the baker for the Pharaoh, they fall into um, trouble with Pharaoh, and so he throws them into prison, and lo and behold, it's the exact same, by coincidence, no, it's the exact same prison that Joseph is in. And so this cupbearer comes and says, man, I had this weird dream last night. And Joseph said, hey, isn't God the one who gives dreams? Tell it to me. I'll tell you what it is. And he says, Joseph, you see, I, I dreamed that there was this vine and there were these grapes and I reached out and I grabbed them. There was Pharaoh's cup and I squeezed the grapes and it went into the cup and then I put it out and Pharaoh took it and he drank it. And he said, oh, well, here's what that dreams means. In three days, you will be restored to your position as cupbearer to Pharaoh. And by the way, when you get there, please don't forget me. You know, he didn't, you know, he wasn't singing. Nobody knows. You know, if anybody could have, it would have been Joseph singing all about his troubles. But he said, look, please remember me. When you get there, remember me. Tell Pharaoh about me. You know, I was brought down from Egypt and I'm in prison. Uh, you know, I don't belong here like every inmate throughout the world has ever said, I don't belong in this jail, right? But he didn't. And so the baker said, wow, hey, I had a dream too. I had a dream that there were these baskets of bread and bread was in them, but these birds kept coming down. There were, there were Pharaoh's baskets, but these birds kept coming and eating them. Oh, your cupbearer, your dream, good. Um, baker, it's not going to be so good for you. What that means is in three days, you will not be restored. Actually, what will happen is you are going to be hanged, 
and your head is, you know, it's just going to be bad for you. Birds are going to come and eat the flesh off of your carcass, your dead carcass. It sounds bad, doesn't it? But it's in there. Read it. It really is. It's not going to be good for you. Cupbearer, it's going to work well. Sure enough, three days later, exactly what Joseph said would happen did. And we end in chapter 40 with the chief cupbearer restored. However, it says, he did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. You know, God never forgets us. People will. But God never forgets us because behind the scenes, this all may seem random, but it's not because God is weaving together a bigger story and a bigger picture. In fact, all of this is building up to chapter 41, where Joseph meets this guy, Pharaoh. See, Pharaoh is two full years later. Pharaoh has this dream. He goes to bed, and he, he dreams one night that out in the Nile River, these seven cows who are fat and just tender and juicy, they are grazing among the reeds. And seven skinny, gaunt, ugly cows come up out of the Nile. They stand beside the riverbank, and they begin to eat these fat, juicy cows. And it says, Pharaoh woke up. I wonder if he woke up and said, man, what did I eat last night? Wow. But then it says he went back to sleep again. And in the second dream, he saw a head of grain with seven, or a grain with, with seven heads. And it was healthy and it was good and it was on one single stalk. But next to it, there were seven stalks that were scorched and thin and bare. And he got everybody together and said, what, what does this dream mean? And nobody could figure it out. But then the chief cupbearer in verse 9 said, Hey, Pharaoh, you remember when we had that thing a few years ago? There was this guy who told me everything that was going to happen. And exactly what he said is exactly what happened. And Pharaoh, I think he might be able to help you. And so Pharaoh said, Okay, bring that guy in. Bring that Hebrew guy in. And so he came in. And it says, When they shaved him and put his clothes on him, they brought him in. And I love this because this is our second faith lesson. You know, we have this false assumption that God takes care of those who, what? Take care of themselves. But the truth is, faith gives credit where credit is due. That's the second faith lesson that we learn. In fact, he pulls this young Hebrew boy who's now about 30 years old and says, hey, I hear that you can interpret dreams. Now, what would you do if you were standing in front of the most powerful man in the world? What would you say? Here's Joseph's response, verse 16. I can't do it. I can't. But God will give Pharaoh the answer that he desires. Now, this is the guy who has the the power to kill Joseph in an instant. I brought you out of prison for you to tell me that I can't do it? No, no, no. But God will give you the answer that he desires, not that you desire, Pharaoh, but that he desires. And so he goes on to tell him the dream and all of this. And and Joseph says, look, the reason you got it in two forms is because God is about to do something that Pharaoh, even your power, your prestige, and your might cannot undo. Something is about to happen that is beyond your control, Pharaoh. But here's what I think you ought to do. And he goes out and he gives him this whole plan of attack and this whole plan for how he ought to go. And this is Pharaoh's response. It's not, who are you? What what are you doing? Listen to this. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 39, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. In fact, what happens is Joseph becomes the second most powerful man in the world at that moment. Why? Because he gave credit where credit was due. He had the faith to say, I can't do it, but God will give you the answer that he desires. You realize that the same precocious trait that got him to Egypt is the same gift from God that brought him to be the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. But the faith lesson is this, is that faith gives credit where credit is due. From this point on, Joseph devises this scheme and he puts it into place. But outside of Egypt, all of the world is in a famine. And that means that in chapter 43, we realize that or chapter, yeah, chapter 42, rather, 
that Joseph's family down in Canaan is going through the exact same famine, and they're suffering through this famine. And so they're sitting together. It says, chapter 42, verse 1, when Jacob learned that there was grain down in Egypt, didn't know how, didn't know what the plan was, just knew that there were provisions. He looked at his sons and said, why do we just keep looking at each other? What do you do when your resources run out? Well, for these guys, Jacob, like we saw last week, these boys who manipulated and schemed their way through life, they had reached the end of their resources, and they were reduced to just sitting in the room looking at each other. And Jacob says, look, boys, you need to go up to Egypt. You need to get some grain for us, take some money, do this. You need to go up there. And that's the moment where we see Joseph and his brothers collide. Look at verse 6. Joseph was the governor of the land and the one who sold grain to all of its people. And so when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground, and he recognized them. And in that instant, it says, verse 9, he remembered his dream about them and said, see, I told you so, right? No, not yet. Not yet. There's a few more chapters of how this is all going to play out. You see, what we learn here is that, you know, we make this assumption that God has bigger and more important things to do than take care of our daily lives. But you know what we see in Joseph's life? That faith looks for God when he seems the furthest away. From chapter 42 over to chapter 45, we see that Simeon is left and they go back home and their grain runs out and Jacob sends the boys back down to Egypt. And they, they kind of hesitate. They say, look, if we go back down there, it's going to be bad. And if we don't bring our youngest brother, Benjamin, it's going to be really bad. It's going to kill Simeon. But his dad says, no, you, you need to go. Go get some grain. And so they take Benjamin, and they go down, and Joseph has this big dinner, and he arranges them so that he says to one of his servants, look, I want you to take my silver cup, and I want you to put it in the backpack of the youngest boy. So they have this meal and they, they go off and his brothers are probably thinking, wow, whew, we are so glad that's over. You know why? Because they have this thing, this debt that is still undone and unpaid. And they deserve to be punished. But Joseph didn't rationalize. He didn't look for the way that he could do it. He was trusting God through all of this. But his brothers, in contrast, were saying, Oh, God, what are you doing to us? Why have you brought us here? In fact, earlier they said, We are in this place because of what we did to our brother. There's just this huge, incredible contrast between the faith of Joseph and God working with him and God moving in his brothers, but yet their sin being very real and in front of them. So finally they go out and the servant goes out and says, Hey, come back. Somebody has stole my master's silver cup. Oh, it's not us. We didn't do it. And so he looks through all the bags, and sure enough, there is the silver cup. And that's where, in chapter 45, we find Joseph and his brothers are standing before each other one more time. And it says Joseph could no longer control himself. He screamed out. He had everybody leave except for his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him outside, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And so Joseph said to his brothers, verse 3, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer. They were probably doing one of the... You see, all this while, Joseph had been using interpreters. And he was speaking in Egyptian and not Hebrew. And probably here, he was speaking to them in Hebrew. And then he says, Come closer. No, no, no. But you see, this is the faith lesson number three. Go ahead and put that up there, Chris. Faith looks for God when he seems the furthest away. You're in the middle of something terrible going on in your life, and you have this false assumption that only good things happen when we trust and obey. Well, Joseph's response when the bad things happened was simply to look for God's hand. In fact, listen to what he says. Come closer. No, really, I'm your brother. Don't be distressed. 
Verse 5, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in this land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you. And they're thinking, wait a second, Joseph. We're the ones who threw you in the pit. We're the ones who sold you. No, 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 no. Verse 8, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh and lord of this entire household. And he did this because he had a bigger plan to save lives. You want to have a faith that sustains you and, doesn't, and isn't shattered because of shallowness? Realize that faith interprets life through God and faith gives credit where credit is due, especially in the times that are good and when the times are bad. And faith looks for God when he seems the furthest away. In fact, one person put it this way. I, I love this. You may even want to write this down. Faith is resting in the fact that God has an object in leaving me on the scene when I feel useless to Him and a burden to others. Hear that again. Faith is resting in the fact that God has an object in leaving me on the scene when I feel useless to Him and a burden to others. See, Joseph just said, you know what? I'm going to trust, and I'm going to obey, and I'm not going to interpret my circumstances through these circumstances. I'm going to look for God's hand to be moving behind the scenes. Do you, is that how you react in tough times? See, another thing that we learn is that when we do this, forgiveness will be a no-brainer. You know why? This, this is the fourth faith lesson you see, we assume that when we're wronged, we can hold out justice until they get what is deserved to them. But you know, only God has the right to hold a grudge. Over in chapter 50, after several years had passed, at the end of 49, Jacob, the dad, dies, and his brothers think, oh my goodness, here it comes. We deserve it. Here, he's just been holding back because he didn't want dad to suffer misery. Here it comes. But, verse 19, Joseph says, Guys, don't be afraid. I, I love this, this phrase. Am I in the place of God? You see, when you hold a grudge and you're unwilling to forgive the wrong that has been done to you, you're not operating with the eyes of faith and forgiveness. You're saying, you know what? No, I think I deserve to be God and Lord over this situation, and they're going to suffer until they get theirs. But Joseph said, am I in the place of God? What you intended for evil, God intended for good to accomplish what is being done now, the saving of many lives. You see, Joseph just simply had the faith to remember who he was, and that who he was was that he was not God. That's the faith lesson number four, is that faith remembers who we are. And this brings us up to the end of his life, where Hebrews eleven twenty two brought us. You see, Joseph stayed in Egypt for a long time, from, the, from 17 up until when he was 110 years. And he saw the third generation of his children and the children of his son Manasseh. They were placed at birth on his knees. And so Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land that he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To which we might say, wait a second, Joseph, we've arrived. Joseph, you are the second most powerful man in the world. Don't you mean that, you know, we're going to just stay here and prosper? But see, Joseph knew the bigger picture. He knew that God had made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and his daddy Jacob. And he did not confuse the gift as being greater than the gift giver. You see, that's faith lesson number five from Joseph's life, is that faith values God's presence in our life over life rewards. We have this tendency to confuse the gift as being more important than the giver. In fact, 
The truth is you don't have to look back more than about a month back to Christmas and you saw kids who kind of operate under that, don't they? Wow, what am I going to get? Oh, I didn't get it. Mom, you said you were going to give it to me. See, we have this tendency to think that God deserves or we're deserving of what God pours out to us and we're owed. But Joseph said, no, 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 no. God's presence in my life is more important than the things that I can have. He didn't confuse the gift with the gift giver. He realized that he was given a blessing in order to be a blessing. And so he just simply lived his life according to the promise of God, looking forward to the day that God would take them out of Egypt. You know why? Because God didn't say, I will be with you in Egypt. He said, I've got a land reserved for you. You are my chosen people, and I will live with you and reside with you, and my presence will be your blessing, and everything else will be the icing on the cake. So how do we move forward with this story? What, what can this do to, to help us in our lives today? What, what can we take from this this morning? Let me ask you a question today. If God gave you this choice, which would you choose? If God were to give you a choice, how would you move forward? How, how would you choose? What if he were to say to you, all right, I'm going to give you the choice. You can have more of the blessings and the gifts and the things that you know, more power, more prestige, more money, more homes, more children, more career, all of these things. You can have more of this, but not so much of me, or I will take all of that away, but you get to keep me. No home, no children, no family, no prestige, stripped of everything, but yet the one truth that God will be with you. Which would you choose? Which one would you choose? More of what you know, more of the blessings that you have, but not so much of God. Or very little of the things of this world but a peace that passes all understanding that God, the promise of Christmas, that God is with you. Which would you choose? Let me frame it a different way. Which would you choose? More of what you know or giving up all of what you have to know that loved ones that you have prayed for would come to have their eternal security set and firm with God. Which would you choose? If God gave you that choice, which would you choose? I heard somebody not too long ago say this. The truth is, if you've been praying for the salvation of your friends, your family, and revival in our country, then you are probably the one of many who is responsible for the economic recession and downturn that we're experiencing. Would you be willing to go through economic recession and lose everything if it meant you and your family would have a revival and relationship with God like you have never known in your life? Would you be willing to go through that? You see, there's a few things I think we can do this morning. If you want to have a faith that doesn't get shattered with the shallowness of our thinking and the realities of life, I think one of the huge things that we need to do is to declare our dependence upon God. We need to come to God and say, you know what, God? I'm only here because you got me here, and only you can lead me forward. That's where we are as a church in many ways. God, we are here in a moment because you have led us here. And God, we don't really seem to, you know, it's, I've been sharing this with you. It's the sheep prayer. We are sheep. Sheep are idiots. 
and we need the shepherd. We will only get anywhere that we get because the shepherd is the one who guides us. God, we are utterly, completely dependent upon you, whether we have good times or bad times. You know, over the last uh, year, there was a guy that I know, he was in jail. And while he was in jail, he was turning to God. I mean, this was the lowest point of his life. He was reading his Bible on a daily basis. In fact, he spent most of his day reading his Bible. He was talking the talk, and he was getting close to God, and he was just moving as far and as fast as he could towards God. And then came the day the judge said, Okay, you, my friend, are now free. He had a job. He had freedom. A new hope for prosperity. Today... Right now, church, he is back in jail because he just stabbed a man four times. See, the truth is, it's not the bad times that show the foundation of our faith. It's the good times that show the truthfulness of what our faith is really like. And then because we are so completely dependent upon God, we need to make sure that we are a blessing. We, we need to use our blessings by being a blessing. You know, we do more together as a group than you can do in your own individual faith pursuits. Do you know that? That's why over this last year I challenged us and led us to send all of these people out from our church on mission. You know why? Because God has blessed you, some of you, so incredibly, us so incredibly, so that we might be a blessing to others. And some of you didn't do it financially, some of you did it through prayer, and that was just as important. But all of us were responsible together for doing what together what we couldn't do individually on our own. That's what Joseph did. And then we, we need to remember whose we are and where it is that we're going. Listen to this. Faith is engaging the deepest joy of heaven, knowing God's unfathomable love for us as we walk through the thorny desolate called right now. Faith is engaging the deepest joys of heaven, knowing God's unfathomable love for us as we walk through the thorny, desolate called right now. Friends, do you know what a hero of the faith looks like? When you look in the mirror, does the image that you see look back and cry out? Not boastfully, I'm a faith hero, but does that image cry back to you, I have a peace that passes all understanding. Regardless of what I have or what I don't have, regardless of where God takes me or where He leaves me, I can say, it is well with my soul. Is that you? Father, today we come before you and we thank you for the life of Joseph. Lord, I'll just say honestly, truthfully, I, I don't know what I would choose. Lord, I want to say that I would choose you. But Father, we have this penchant for walking by our eyes and our hands rather than by faith. And so, Lord, as we come before you this morning, my guess is I'm not the only person in this room who struggles with that probing question. If you were to give us that choice, would we willingly give up everything that we know in order to have more of you? Father, the truth is, I don't know if I'd make the exchange for everything that I know for loved ones, but God, nudge me that way. Lord, only you can do that in me. I can't do it, and I can't manufacture it, and no one in this room can either. And so, God, I will pray this today. Do whatever you need to do to get us to that place. If that means desperately bad times, bring it, so that we might fall on our knees before you. And, Father, if that means good times so that we might be challenged, Lord, I just am going to lean in on my small group of friends who are encouraging me and challenging me to be strengthened and to walk with you. And Lord, I'm going to stay with your word. But Father, this I do know, is that we in this room are sheep, which means we're not very bright spiritually. 
And we're not going to get anywhere unless you, our shepherd, leads us and guides us and directs us. So, Father, thank you for this life of Joseph, who at the end of his life said, I will not confuse the gift with the gift giver. God, thank you. Because you are good. And you will lead us. And it may not seem like it sometimes, but you are never silent. You are never inactive. You are never not moving on behalf of those who are your own. So God, today, move in our hearts. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand this morning. We want to give you a chance to respond to what you've heard. There's a song that we're going to sing. Without him, I would be nothing. Can you say that as a faith statement this morning? Maybe this morning as you think about declaring your dependence on God, it means surrendering the reins of control of your heart to him by accepting what Christ did for you on the cross. Would you do that today? Maybe this morning what you need to do is say, God, you have blessed me so incredibly. I need to figure out how I can be a blessing to others and maybe still others. Maybe just what you need to be reminded of today is that you are a child of the living God, adopted not because of anything you did, but because of what he did for you. And he has a place perfectly planned and prepared for you. So if we lose everything, it will not take away our eternity. Maybe that's the reminder you need to know today. Would you come to this altar and just say before God, Lord, help me to choose you as my peace and my joy. Would you come to this altar like many in the early service did? If you need to speak to me, I'll be at the side. I would love to talk to you about joining First Baptist Church or following through in believers' baptism or accepting Christ. But today, if God is speaking to you, come to this altar right now. As Jim leads us, as we sing, without him, we could do nothing because we would be nothing. Let's sing this as a prayer of commitment. Jim, lead us. You've just heard a message from God's Word. Right now in our worship time, many are responding to what they have just heard. You can respond too, right where you are. Maybe you've never considered how you can make God the centerpiece of your life, but you can by simply praying a very simple prayer with me right now. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that there is no other way to get to you except through Jesus, God's one and only Son. I believe that He came that he lived and died and rose again. And now I want to trust him as my only way to enter into a personal relationship with you, my Heavenly Father. I want to repent of my sins and turn to you and make you my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for accepting me just as I am. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, or even if you've prayed that prayer in the past, your next step is always to grow in your faith. We want to encourage you to find a church that will help you to see how God's Word can make an impact in your daily life. We'd like to have the opportunity to be that church, and you can let us by joining us every Sunday morning at 8.30 and 11 o'clock in one of our weekly worship times. We know that by choosing to watch today, you are seeking to make God a very special part of your life. We hope you'll go even further in this pursuit throughout this next upcoming year. Again, thanks for watching, and we hope that you'll join us again next week at this same exact time.